How you all doing tonight? Hi. Rock and Roll James here with you. Hashtag PBT. Got a special Thursday night show. And uh, we thank you for joining us on this cold Thursday night. Manta frito. Are you cold, baby? I'm extremely cold. Really? I'm all bundled up. I'm like, How about you, Fish? We got Felicia here with us. Hey. Um... <laughs> It's well. I'm I'm a little warm. I had a big old jacket on. I took it off. Yeah. But it's cold outside. It's it's gonna get colder F- tonight. Felicia just witnessed an accident, babe, and she, it was scary. like right yeah. behind her, right here, right at the at the yeah. cross section. At the here. intersection. So yeah, I, what happened, fish? No, I passed the light. I was uh-huh. coming from the north side. I was going south. I passed the light, and the I heard like a loud noise, mm-hmm. and I thought I had run over something. Yeah. Like you know, like those manholes that you run over and they're yeah, super yeah. loud yeah yeah so i had to make a u-turn to park anyways and when i made the u-turn i saw the accident it had just happened so i got off i, I mean i got off my car i parked to render aid and there was already somebody there and it just so happened the fire truck was passing by so the fire truck stopped and so the uh, show was crying I was I was not Dad, crying. I, 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 I'm like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> I was just like shocked because it had just happened. Behind, like, it was the car behind me. Just thank and God I just it wasn't thought, you. Like seconds, Man. you know. But well, we, l- they, we, yeah. What was that? Well, we saw. I went outside. <laughs> yeah. No. Thankfully, the girl was. It was a girl. She was okay. Thank God. So everybody was okay. And that, there was a man inside a car, and the airbag had kind of uh, started up. Yeah. And he was in there just checking somebody, Checks, maybe a yeah. lawyer or something like that. Oh, no. Yeah, they just got done cleaning it up, so it was yeah, it was pretty bad. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again. Uh, we are going to start our show. It's a special Thursday Night Live brought to you by the campaign elect Victor Avila for Texas Land Commissioner. Orale. And uh, so we've got uh, Victor here with us. How you doing, Victor? I'm doing really good, Rock. Thank you for having me. It's all well. You might have heard the song we were just playing a little bit ago, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Felicia is the one that said, we got to play this on to intro Victor to the show. Victor's a retired ICE agent, and he is running for land commissioner, man. That is awesome, Victor. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of people always uh, ask me, because I'm a big fan of Narcos, the show. Yeah. And is that is that accurate? Is that real? Let me tell you, uh, the Narcos Mexico, especially that edition, uh-huh. very real. Very real, very... Uh, of course, you got the Hollywood aspects of it, of uh-huh. course, so for the drama and dramatic effect. But when you look at the overall production of the show, it's very well done. I know, dude. It's so... You know, and it's crazy because I was telling my wife that even though the DH and Victor... Uh, uh, Kike Kike Camarina, Camarina, right? Even though he is for the better and a good, the good guy... We tend to side with the bad guy, man. Yeah, and that's the... It's uh, crazy the way these movies are portray these... Uh, the glorification. The yeah. glorification, like, well, I want to be, you know, uh, Gallardo Felix. I yeah. want to be that guy. Why? Why do you want to be... You should want to be the agent, you know? What, what <laughs> is it with that, man? It's 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 culture. It's a it's a very deep culture in the, in the music, in the movies, in the guns, in mm. the drugs. It's embedded in our everyday life. Yeah. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Victor not only is not only running for uh, Texas Land Commissioner, we're going to ask him about that in just a little bit, but he's also got a book out, and Ooh. you need to get it and read it. It's awesome. Tell us a little bit about the book, Victor. The book, Agent Under Fire, A Murder and a Manifesto. Uh, you'll find it under Agent Under Fire, Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. This book I wrote after going through uh, a very horrific event in my career uh, 10 years ago. Actually, it'll be 11 next month. Uh, when I was assigned uh, in Mexico, I was a, a U.S. Uh, special agent, a U.S. diplomat assigned to the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. And on February 15, 2011, Special Agent Jaime Zapata and I, on, a, on an assignment mm-hmm. to drive from Mexico City towards Monterrey to meet our uh, ICE agents from that office, uh, to exchange some equipment, bring some equipment to Mexico City for another case. On the way back, we were ambushed by Los Zetas cartel. I remember when that happened. Oh yeah. Uh, we have a small video clip that uh, Isela sent us. Uh, before we go to it, you've got Isela with you. You want to introduce her to our audience? Isela Linquez has been a, a, a great uh, supporter of mine. She's now helping me with my campaign. Um, she even helped me the... The last time that I came to the border to do a border tour, I've mm-hmm. been coming to the border since March with this whole, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the border, of yeah. course, but uh, I started coming down here, see what the heck is going on down there at the border, because I got to go see for myself. Uh, I had never seen anything like this in the 20 years 
of public service that I had. And so Isela has been very, very kind to me and helping me navigate through the areas with the locals yeah. and setting up uh, speaking engagements and all that. And now she's working for my uh, campaign to help me. Uh, you know, go out there and meet the people. Yeah. When we come back, we'll tell you where Victor's from and, uh, you know, uh, what his upbringing was like and how he entered law enforcement and became a federal agent. And uh, it, it's just, I was talking to him when we were having lunch today and his stories, man, he's just got so many cool stories. But Isela, how's it going working with, uh, with Victor here? I love it. When you have somebody with his gifts, his talents, his charisma, this is meant for him. Mm -hmm. He's, he needs to win this election. The people of Texas need him in, in this office, in this position. All right. Well, let's check out that video. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Victor, Victor, I'm in from ICE. We got a shot. We got a shot. We are on the highway of Querétaro, Mexico. We've been shot and attacked on the highway. I am an ICE special agent. What is your name, you said, sir? Victor Avila, please call Jerry Miles. I don't have another phone. So did you look at please me, call Jerry Miles. We've been shot on the highway. Highway? What is the highway, sir? To where? Mexico, Querétaro. They know where I'm at. Uh, okay. Try to remain online, please. That is absolutely... Uh, it's, it's kind of crazy to hear, you know. Uh, but uh, the book is called Agent Under Fire, A Murder and a Manifesto. How can people get the book? Uh, agentunderfirebook.com. Okay. Or directly to Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. You get that book, you're going to know who you're voting for, for Texas Land Commissioner. Now, uh, how old are you anyway, dude? I'm 49. I'll be 49? 50. Oh, I'll be really? 50 this year, man. Yeah, it was, yeah, you've taken care of yourself. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, hey, I, you know, I say the joke is some of the Chihuahua Taramaras. Uh, see? <laughs> I got the, what, I got the what good. Is, Chihuahua, what uh, is my, that? My parents are okay. from Chihuahua, so uh, I got the good genes there. Well, I was going to ask you about your parents. Uh, so they're from Chihuahua. My parents are, are both from Chihuahua City. Uh, they came to this country in, in early 60s legally. Uh -huh. um, and uh, they migrated here and, you know, they assimilated to this country. It's something that I write about in the book, which I think we have lost in the people that are coming to this country. Forget the legal immigration, the illegal immigration. Mm. Immig people that are coming here illegally have forgotten that, hey, the reason you wanted to come here is because maybe you wanted to be American. And we've lost a lot of that. The reason they want to come to the United States is because the United States is going to give them all this free stuff, but they still want their country here. They want uh, Guatemala here. They want Afghanistan here. They want Russia here. They want China here. They want Mexico here. And you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, the I think the whole idea of the patriotism and coming in and learning the national anthem or your Absolutely. Pledge of Allegiance and... Uh, you know, getting your citizenship, you know, uh, was part of becoming uh, American. You know, you become an American and uh, and it, it seems like the way it's going, it's becoming a little more tribal where everybody's going to have their own little country in, a, in, a, in one state. Very segregated. Which it's I mean, I don't mind. Uh, of course, we got to keep our culture, and, you know, and all that stuff. But we have to have some sense of unity by being the same countrymen. You know, I agree with you 100%. Um, I say that all the time because I'm an American and I'm an American first. Uh, I was born and raised here in Texas. And but that doesn't mean that I ignore my Mexican heritage. I love my Mexican heritage. I love Mexico. I love uh, the food, the music uh, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I embrace it. But there's a difference of uh, wanting to do it illegally here and the protection of, a, of our sovereignty as the United States of America and our laws. Everybody ignores our laws. But try to ignore Mexico and see what happens. Yeah, no, it, it, there's got to be laws. There's got to be borders, you know, yeah. and uh, there's got to be uh, some sort of sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you're from El Paso. So your parents, they went from Chihuahua to El Paso? Or uh, actually, my, they initially first went to California. My older sister uh, was born in California. Then they uh, came to El Paso, uh, and uh, my, myself and my sister have a twin sister mm -hmm. who is an attorney there in Arlington, Texas, and uh, we're born there, born and raised there. And, you know, border town, very, you know, we share that, the yeah. familiarity of the, of the border town, very unique. Is there a difference between El Paso and the Valley? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. What's a, what, what, to you, what, what do you feel is the difference? Nombre, vato, como? 
<laughs> is it the lingo? No, no, no. Like, do we have different styles of speech, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. I, and I, and uh, believe me, I grew up in El Barrio, and I, uh, I we had this conversation earlier today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm teaching my son. We grew up where I got in my bike when I was a kid. And I was gone for 10 hours. Yeah. And I just heard my sister yelling and somebody, and I knew it was time to serve supper and come yeah. back to eat. And those were different times. And yeah. unfortunately, we can't, we don't get to do a lot of that in our country anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, my barrio kid, uh, a lot of street smart. You know, mm -hmm. you can't you can't teach that. You have to just kind of grow up with that. Yeah, getting in fights and Jeez. dealing and uh, solving your own issues at that level. Yeah. No parents involved. No and school involved. You take care of it right then and yeah. there. And that experience should come handy becoming a nice agent, right? I mean, street level type of absolutely. You, know, you play out in the street and all that. Growing the, up in the a, lingo, yeah, the language. The language. Now, you went to school in El Paso. I went to school. I graduated from UTEP. And in school, how were you? Like, did you have a B honor roll? What were you? I was thinking? a good kid. I was a good kid. I was were you in AB. sports. Uh, I was a big soccer player, uh, and then uh, when I was 11 years old, my dad took me to the local rec center to join a karate class. And I never another in Cobra Kai. Dad. Este, <laughs> como dicen chingón. Yeah. <laughs> Pero I, I became a, a black belt at the age of 16. Wow, wow. dude. Yeah. So a style of Shotokan and a lot of discipline. And I'm a. I've always been a, a disciplined kid. My mom was. Uh, I was very spoiled with me. I wasn't the kid that left socks thrown on the floor. Uh -huh. You go into my room as a kid, you thought, this kid is weird. Super made up, super clean, super neat. Yes. A weirdo. <laughs> sort of obsessive compulsive. Uh, yeah, a little bit. A, a little, little bit. bit. A little <laughs> bit. And I had to get rid of a little bit of that as I grew up. Uh, clean car, clean, you know. But that's like, all detail. Very detail, very organized. Yeah. To uh, be in law enforcement, you got to be like that too, right? I mean, I just gotta, had that eye, that eye yeah. for it. Detail, like. Uh, for some reason, uh, I'm terrible with names, uh -huh. but if I see you somewhere, I'll never forget you. Dude, I'm I'm b we're bad with both, right? <laughs> yeah, you're bad with, yeah, yeah I, you are. I always say the story of that movie, uh, what was the name of it? Uh, Devil Wears Prada. Yeah, the Devil Wears Prada. Where the Prada. ladies like at the party and the girls behind her are telling her who it is and what they do. <laughs> you know, the assistant. We'll run uh -huh. into people and it'll be like, you remember him? Like, what? I don't you know, sometimes, man, yeah. I'm, I'm getting bad, but you know, it comes with age, Yeah, and the bro. name, that's the way I am with the names. Yeah. And, uh, but the face, oh, if I spot you once, I know. Yeah. And then you went to college after you Went to college, went to UTEP, graduated with a criminal justice degree, and then what am I going to do, you know? And my career pathway started, I became a Texas parole officer for TDCJ. How old were you when you decided, or when you, you know, because I knew when I was in junior high, I'm going to be a DJ, I'm going to be in a band, I'm going to do this. When did you decide that, and what inspired you to become uh, or get into law enforcement? I, I, I'm not one of those that going to say, oh, yeah, when I was five, I was going to be a police officer. No, no. I, I, I was a police explorer uh, for the El Paso Police Department, which is part of the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. They give you a uniform. You you go with police officers on ride-alongs. You work the parade. I do a lot of community service, and that helped me understand to see the police officer as a human being. I grew up fearing the police in a good sense, kind of like how you fear your dad. Respect. Or discipline. Respect, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. He pulls up next to you. You tighten up a little bit. You I think we've lost a lot of that in our country as well. And so when I saw the police officers, they're like, these are just regular people. They have problems too. They have mm -hmm. to pay bills. They have to eat. And the stress level is oh like my God. above but then, everything. But let me tell you what I realized about police work when I initially got, it was, I was 16, 17. All I did was karate. And then I was doing this on the side. And it's very boring to be a police officer. People don't realize that. It is one of the most boring jobs. But you go from zero to 10 in half a second yeah. and you could lose your life. And yeah. that's the part that people, it's very hard to understand. That. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's crazy. So you decided you wanted to be in the law enforcement once you got out of college. How did that happen? What yeah. So um, eventually when I got to college, I, I thought I wanted to be an architect. I thought I wanted to be, uh, I love cars. I love cars. And I love the guys that would check the cars and do all the stuff and test drive in a lot. And then they said, uh, well, those people are called engineers. Okay. And I'm not going to be one of those. <laughs> Math was not my strong point. <laughs> it makes two of us. Yeah. So I guess I will be a sociology and criminology major in, in, in college. And I started liking that uh, in the law enforcement. And so there's a lot of federal law enforcement and, and presence on the borders. You know, we got cops from everywhere. Uh -huh. Every federal agency is there. There's a lot of work and you, they're very visible. And uh, everybody strives. Oh, I want to be a federal agent. Well, what's a federal agent? Well, a special agent, they call them, right? Mm -hmm. Criminal, a federal criminal investigator. I remember... Uh, checking that and seeing what that's all about, and, uh, and you, I, you don't. I didn't start off as that. I started as a Texas parole officer, uh, and that introduced me to the criminal world. Mm -hmm. uh, 
really dealing with the criminal element. I thought that when people went to prison, that's it. They went to prison forever. No, almost everyone comes out at one point. Mm -hmm. And very dangerous individuals, sex offenders, violent offenders, gang members, you name it. They come back out to the community and you have to, they have to be reintegrated. Well, I was in charge of supervising them. And I supervised what they call the super intensive supervision program, which was uh, supervising the worst of the worst sex offenders, gang members, violent people. And it, it, it eventually what it did, it, it, it emerged me into that criminal underworld, that culture that is um, sometimes if you never live it, it's very hard to understand. But having conversations with gang members, Texas Syndicate gang members, Barra Azteca, all these uh, gangs, um, hearing their culture, how they fight not to be not to commit crimes it is something else. And, uh, you know, young kids, older, or what they call veteranos, criminals. And uh, I, learned a lot. And stuff. I, lear I learned a lot from them, a lot from them that, you know, started shaping my career. So I found, found out as a parole officer that there was the same position at the federal level. It's called the federal probation officer. Mm -hmm. And get paid twice as much. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what am I doing here? So I applied to be a federal probation officer. It took me to San Antonio to be a, a USPO, a United States probation officer. And that was, you know, get to wear a suit. You uh, work with the United States courts. Now I'm writing reports to the district court judge, the pre-sentence reports. Now I'm also doing supervision, but mostly now dealing with the attorneys, the U.S. attorneys, the, the defense counsels, uh, the whole other world. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to do that for 20 years. So my career I eventually transferred back to El Paso. And how old were you when you were doing this? You were oh, about I was in my early 20s. Early 20s? Uh, yeah, I started Man. parole at 22. Uh -huh. And um, I think at 25, I went to uh, parole and uh, or U.S. probation. Were you ever intimidated when you were running into some of these uh, these, these criminals that, I mean, at a young age like that? I, w I was always very I'm, mature for my age. Well, you had the black belt back in you. Yeah. Up, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I wasn't arrogant, but I was confident. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, you have that, to be because they they spot weakness quick, yes. dude. You have to carry yourself a certain way uh -huh. and have a certain presence of, uh, of you. And, and I did have that. And I had the respect from I was a, I was a very strict guy. And they would say, hey, Avila, because I call you, hey, Avila, what do you do? This? Hey, just follow the rules, man. I'm very simple. Fair, mm -hmm. fair. follow the rules and you're going to be good to go. And I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my career. But after doing that for five years and talking to all the special agents, interviewing them for the reports, the DEA agents, U.S. Customs agents, uh, uh, Secret Service agents, uh, FBI, all of those guys. I really loved and talking to them of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And then I said, I, I really want to, I don't want to read about them and I don't want to be interviewing them. I want to do what they do. So yeah. I applied to be a special agent with the U.S. Customs Service. And this was in your early 20s still, right? About 25 yeah, I'm, now, I'm, now, now, now I'm hitting 30 now. You're hitting 30. I'm 30 now. So you did uh, the probationary stuff. Uh, you did it for about five, six, uh, six All together about eight years. Eight years. And then you went into that. And how, how did it, uh, how did that begin? Did you have to go through some physical? Oh, yeah. Uh, did oh, you yeah. have to go to some boot camp or anything like uh, that? 22-week academy. And Almost where, six months. Where was this academy at? Glencoe, Georgia. Glencoe, Georgia. You went out to Glencoe, Georgia. You're about to be 30 years old, and you're just making a big old career move, man. And what happens when you get to Georgia? It um, well, it was it was a little tough for me because I was a little older, and um, I had worked in the federal service with the federal probation, but you know, had to get back into shape, mm -hmm. um, the physical part of it, and studying. It's kind of like being back in college. A yeah. lot of a lot of uh, law classes, a lot of that uh, uh, criminal investigating courses. How to how to secure a crime scene. How mm -hmm. to take photographs. How to do a search warrant. How to do an arrest warrant. Surveillance. You name it. You know, criminal investigator, special agents are very very specialized uh, uh, training, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I would never trade this job. I had never spoken to any special agent that said, eh, "I don't like this job." Yeah. Not one person. It's a great job. And, you know, shooting, a lot of guns and, you know, techniques and ground fighting and, uh, you know, tactical. So I enjoyed all that. Uh, and But it was tough for me because my wife was pregnant with my or our son. I already had a daughter. And uh, he was born while I was at the academy. I couldn't be there for the birth. And uh -huh. they let me go, and I got there one day late. Uh, so that was really tough, you know, to knowing that your wife's having the baby and you can't be there. It was really stressful. But then I got to go see him for two days and then had to go back to the academy and, and went through that and eventually graduated. Got very lucky to go back to El Paso, but it was a great advantage to me because 
because I know El Paso like the back of my hand, and yeah. I always went to Juarez. May I may not have gone over there for a little party. Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> it, Nobody it, knows. It, it used to be where we could go back there. Remember, you know? remember those days? We'd yeah. go to Reynosa and have a blast, and then come back and <laughs> not remember how you got back, yeah. you know, and you still got back. <laughs> it was it was great. Times. It was just man. I mean, uh, it, it's pretty. I mean, I haven't been to Mexico in about twenty years. Maybe yeah. even longer than that. It's a shame that it's no longer the same. It, 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 yeah, it's just not. And so then it, you went to Juarez or Juarez all the time. I grew up partying over there and going, having a great time over there. And uh -huh. um, it, uh, you know, I knew Juarez. So all of a sudden, you're, I'm doing criminal investigations, sources, and uh, the first thing they throw you into is narcotics investigations. And I was successful at it because I knew the groundwork, I knew the streets, I knew Juarez. I would interrogate these guys, and they try to tell me some crap story about. Yeah, I was over here, and I said, well, you, you would interrogate them in the street, or you oh no, if I would arrest them and try to arrest get them, arrest them and, and, and interrogate them and get them the confession, and they'll say something like, uh, "Oh yeah, I was at this part of Juarez," and I said, "Wait a minute, you mean by the blockbuster on this corner of the street?" And they'd be like, "How the hell did this Whoa. guy know?" Because yeah. <laughs> I know Juarez, right? Yeah. I, yeah, and so it a lot of those things. My probation officer days as a court system, which is the a lot of people think when you slap cuffs on somebody, hey, we got him, it's over. It's just the beginning. Now you got to go through the court system, yeah. the judicial system. And a lot of the agents didn't have that background, and I did. It was a great advantage to know what is to come. I used to know what questions to ask them at the interrogation. That's what, what's going to nail them for the, for, the, uh, for the points, what they call the, uh, the uh, sentencing guidelines. Uh -huh. I already knew what questions to ask to get them. If you had a child with him, if you have somebody with you using a child to commit a crime— if you never ask, did you use this child for advantage to commit this crime? Mm -hmm. If you don't ask that question, you don't get the answer. Well, you don't know. But if you do ask and they say, yeah, I brought my son or I brought my niece so they wouldn't detect me. Boom, that's you know two more years in prison. Yeah. And the defense counsels didn't like that about me. No. <laughs> wow, man. And so you entered uh, you know, law, federal law enforcement. You started going to Juarez. And how did you end up with uh, Jaime Zapata and all that? that that's really... That's really what, because I remember when that came out yes. on the news, you know, I saw the Suburban all shot up yes. on the, like a road. It's like yeah. almost a mountain. Uh, almost. High, highway 57. And yeah. so it happened by, um, uh, I started my uh, Juarez, my Mexican career, or, uh, or, or they call it overseas. Going and this was Juarez, like. Uh, 2008. 2008. Okay. So in 2009, I'm in Juarez, assigned to the U.S. consulate in Juarez, working uh -huh. with the two ICE agents there. That led to my permanent assignment to Mexico City at the embassy. And as a U.S. diplomat, you get a black passport. You are an accredited diplomat. You're still an ICE agent, but you don't have any power in Mexico. Mm -hmm. The power is you do everything through the government of Mexico and the federal police. And we did a lot of training, human trafficking, money laundering, uh, drug smuggling, you name it, right? Arms trafficking. And it's the most I ever worked in my life. And I talk a lot about it in the book. I, I really spell it out. Because I still thought at one point when I went, I'm going to be a diplomat. And I seen these movies, these guys having these fine wines and parties. Yeah, yeah. Might have had a little bit of that. But it wasn't. It, in Mexico, it was work. And it was an incredible amount of work where I neglected my family. As it is in law enforcement, it's very hard on the family because you work odd hours. And, you know, you're not there for a lot of birthdays. You miss a lot of special occasions. Well, in Mexico, yeah. I wasn't there at all. I mean, sometimes I was in my house two, three days out of the month, uh -huh. traveling throughout Mexico, Central America, and, of course, the United States. And what was a typical day for you guys? I mean, like I mean, like, oh, yeah. I mean, like you said, sometimes nights and stuff, sometimes days. What, what, when you all were over there, you said you didn't have, you had to go through the government Which, to do things. So it was always with them uh, doing criminal investigations. For me, I focused a lot on human trafficking. I was in charge of the Global Trafficking in Persons Initiative. It's called GTIP. I, uh, my whole purpose was to take down human traffickers and organizations, and that's what I did. So I spent a lot of time with the Mexican government getting intelligence, locating these individuals, interviewing victims, flying to the U.S., rescuing kids, children, and women. Um, at the same time, we have a smuggling group of Afghans through Mexico. Uh, identify that organization. I got a source in Denver. I got to go interview that guy. I mean, uh, I got to go to Panama because uh, we got... So many, I mean, it was crazy wow. everywhere, everywhere. It was flying, driving, uh, traveling within Mexico, within the country of Mexico. I did a Southern board assessment of Mexico for a week down in the jungle uh, with the border of Guatemala and Mexico to see they wanted in, in Washington, D.C. They wanted an assessment like what's going on. 
Well, it's very easy. It's open. Mm-hmm. If you think our southern border is open, over there is wide open. Yeah. I walked in, walked into Guatemala and came back like if nothing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, uh, I see all this traffic going on and uh, where there's, where there's uh, obviously terrain and then where there's the river, they get in the, in the, in the rafts and come back and forth with five pesos and, and, and do trade and buy stuff. And it's wide open. So we, we did a whole assessment in the jungle. I mean, Mexico is beautiful too. And, uh, very rural, uh, a lot of resources there mm-hmm. that, that uh, unfortunately have, have gone on the wayside because uh, the cartels have taken over. Yeah. How do you think human trafficking is like at an all time high more than any time ever? Uh, or I mean, because uh, it, it's crazy to see, you know, the border crisis. Right. Yeah. And which, by the way, yesterday they had a press conference with President Biden and they didn't ask him one question about it. It was two hours long, and they didn't ask him any questions about the border situation. Where here in the Rio Grande Valley, it's like we hold the record for the most, uh, oh, yeah. you know, uh, Ill- illegal immigrants passing through. Right. And there's even a park over here that's got, uh, you know, people with uh, COVID, you know, because they don't have anywhere to put them for quarantine and stuff like that. So not one question I, I saw yesterday, and uh, you know, the, also Del Rio, you had the all the Haitians in there. Yeah. Uh, it's it seems to be out of control right now, right? What do you think? And, that, and that's the major problem is that just what you just said that there's no questions about it. How can you not question <laughs> was, the president shocked. of what's going on? This is the the number one issue in the it. country. Um, a lot of people that are running, and we'll talk about that. It, everybody's mentioning the border. That's the number one issue because it's affecting a lot of us, not just in our state, but in the rest of the, of the, of the country. And it, it is, you asked me about human trafficking. It might be at, at the all time high, but what's happened is there the awareness I think is at the all time high people for me, human trafficking is not new. I've been investigating human trafficking for many, many years, mm-hmm. identifying victims, doing a lot of training, uh, training uh, state and locals, when you go to uh, training ER doctors, when the victims are taken to the doctor by the trafficker because she's sick, uh, and they, they treat her like a car. You would, I need the car to work. So just fix her up enough and let's go. But it's the trafficker. It's not the boyfriend. It's not the husband. And the trafficker is there. And you got to understand there's force, fraud, or coercion behind this. Some people are like, uh, why, why don't they run away? Why don't they escape? Mm. Some do. They're not shackled. They don't have to be shackled. They have been defeated. They have been coerced to a level, a psychological level that it's very hard to us to understand if we've never been a victim of that. Mm-hmm. And we're talking by physical force. We're talking about, I have your child and I will cut off his fingers and send them to you type of coercion. I will deport, have you deported. I've taken your documents from you. You will, you're not free to leave. It's a slave. Yeah. And most of it is sexual exploitation. Some of it is also for labor. Let's not forget that there's a lot of men and women being at, uh, at work here in the United States um, at forced labor, which they get paid very little or nothing to work in the camps and work in other uh, like sweatshop type of uh, situations. Yeah. I, I, you know, what really freaked me out? It was like, uh, I guess about like 10 years ago, um, there was like a record amount of unaccompanied minors and there was like 70,000 here in the Donna or, or in the Rio Grande Valley mm-hmm. area. I think that they were uh, being, uh, you know, kept in uh, facilities um, what is whole, the whole idea about the minors coming unaccompanied, you know, it, it, there's uh there's child trafficking involved. There's child recycling involved. There's uh, some are just actual kids that are going to be reunited with their parents because they separate them. And I'll give you a quick example in El Paso. We, we were working in El Paso. We take down uh, a motel of illegal aliens with a smuggler. And it's about uh, 18, 17 or 18 illegal aliens, all adults, men and women, we would take them in to get processed. Border Patrol helps us to, they're better at processing and they help us. They come into the office to help us process. Um, I'm there just kind of walking, helping around. My partners are interviewing the, the, the smuggler. And one of the ladies in the tank, uh, the new little alien is like, mi hija, mi hija. She's telling me in Spanish, my daughter, my daughter. And I go over there like, wait, what daughter are you talking about? There's no kids at the motel. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, I gave him my daughter. I gave the guy, meaning the smuggler. So I go over there, talk to my partner, say, we got to press this guy. So we press him, and I go in there and interrogate him, and he gives up the address of where this child might be. In El Paso, we suit up, 
But we, you know, we detain everybody. We suit up. We go hit this house in El Paso. Boom, 18 kids in the house. Oh my wow. Dude. Four adults taking care of them. None of them, their parents, obviously, including her 18-month-old daughter is there. This is a long time ago. Mm-hmm. A long time oh, That's the point that I'm making. This didn't happen yesterday. It's been happening for a long, long time. And so all of a sudden, we're like, what in the world? 18 kids. Now imagine the thousands that you just thought about. With 18 kids, we were overwhelmed that night. We're like, we need vans. We need car seats. We We need uh, 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 diapers. We need uh, formula. We need resources. resources. All of a sudden, we call CPS. We call the state. We got all these people to help us out. And where are the parents? I have no clue where these parents are at. And, And a lot of these kids are recycled to be used to be smuggled. Uh, I other, always thought that. They, they they use them. I'll use this child, use uh, the cartel, use them to enter their people that they want to enter, like a family unit. Mm-hmm. Some are just straight up trafficked. Some are sold. Some are reunited with their parents. Some are reunited with a family member. All of the above, if you can think about it, all of the above. What's happening now is now you're more aware of it. And yes, it doesn't help that the border's wide open mm-hmm. and they keep on doing it even yeah. more so now. Yeah. You were uh, mentioning earlier that um, that a lot of different cultures from different countries are assimilating in Mexico. Yeah. And they end up coming up as Mexicans when they're not really Mexicans. Tell me a little bit about that, bro. Middle Easterners. Um, I used to in, uh, interview them there in Mexico and got access to go into the uh, detention facilities in Mexico. And we're talking about illegal aliens that we call in Department of Homeland Security, we call them SIAs, special interest aliens that come from Bangladesh, Somalia, Yemen, um, este, uh, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, high countries that support terrorism. So these individuals obviously looked at a little bit closer. So they're, they're in Mexico. They've been in Mexico for a long time. And some of them do enter the United States, but a lot of them have stayed in Mexico and have formed community there. In, in Tijuana, there's a huge community of Middle Easterners that even have even built their own mosque there. And what they've done is they have people coming in, especially right now that they know that the border is wide open, encouraging other Middle Easterners to come in and they get set up, they shave their beards, they, clo- they, they cut their hair, they dress like a Mexican national, incorporate themselves in these uh, caravans of thousands of people and boom, come in, they learn the language, and they come in and sneak into our country. Some, these guys don't turn themselves in. These guys are smuggled in. Uh Uh, Most of them are smuggled in. And right now we have the highest rate of smuggling in back of tractor trailers and dump trucks and uh, sand trucks and you name it. You see accident, you hear about accidents happening. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. It's uh, it's pretty crazy, but uh, um, they they can come in like sleeper agents, you know. Yep. You never know, right? Well, uh, two weeks ago, Mexico released a uh, eight terrorists from Yemen. Uh, they didn't call the they didn't call the FBI. They didn't call Homeland Security. This guy is on the terror FBI terror watch list, mm-hmm. and he's we don't know where he's at. Is he in Mexico? Is he already in here? Yeah. This is a this is this is a national security issue. It's a public safety issue. The last thing I want to see is our country be affected by another attack. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I don't want anybody else to get hurt. We have a lot of illegal aliens that come into this country and hurt U.S. citizens. And I, I every time I, sp- I do public speaking, if I have a public speaking event on a Monday and I have another one on Friday, unfortunately, I have new material to share, not just about the cartels, but about another person being hurt at the hands of an illegal alien, daughter being killed while she's riding her tricycle in her cul-de-sac or a lady being raped by an illegal alien. All these crimes that you think should be 100% preventable because they shouldn't have been here to begin with. We have a lot of crime in our own country, and I interviewed a lot of the of the undocumented people from Central America, and one of the things they say, we have a lot of crime in Honduras, we have a lot of crime in El Salvador, and, 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 and it's true. But uh, why has the burden been placed on the United States? Why isn't the burden placed on the government of El Salvador to take care of their people? Or the burden been placed on Guatemala. I, I'm not being inhumane or, or I'm not compassionate. It's just that we have a lot of crime here too. Mm-hmm. Go to Chicago, go to St. Louis, go to Austin, Texas, that uh, set the record for the most homicides ever in that year. Mm-hmm. We're out of control with crime here. We have, we have our own problems. We have fentanyl overdoses. We have meth that is causing havoc all over the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Texas Land Commissioner, how, right. how did that come about? 
you uh, decided to just one day run for something? Because have you ever been in politics before? No, I've never been in politics, but I had run for my local city council once, and uh, that's what introduced me into politics. But uh, would you like a water? I'll take it. Thank yeah. you. The uh, the the um, the politics fascinated me because it reminded me a lot of uh, a police work, believe it or not. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's dirty, man. It's uh, I'm like, this is like, <laughs> this yeah. is like, this is like uh, undercover work all over again. <laughs> yeah. Dude. I don't know which no, one's worse. It's, it's been, it's been pretty crazy. I mean, uh, so many things happening in the United States of America right now. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, you know, you've got COVID, you know, are you vaccinated? I'm not. I, ha not? I had COVID last year. My wife and I had COVID. And went to the doctor. They did the, the check on us on antibodies. Mm -hmm. You're good. So you're good. Your so whole you're good. family. Right. Mm -hmm. I know my daughter did get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, my son did not. Um, he had COVID too, and he's good. My daughter had. Uh, she actually had COVID not so long ago, even though she was vaccinated. Yeah. But she had like a little cold yeah. for about three days, and she was good. That's crazy, man. That, that like that really like I. It was shocking with me when when they when they told us shelter in place. You're gonna be in mm -hmm. there. You can't walk out. You gotta have an essential card. And I was like, well, they're just going to start making some bootleg essential, essential cards, cards, you know, because we don't, we'll get around when we want to, bro. You know what I'm saying? I don't it's like these vaccine cards, too, dude. You know, like they say, hey, you need a vaccine card. Boy, they're going to make money making those bootleg Rock, vaccine Rock, cards. They're saying uh, uh, the people from Mexico that are coming in. This is the problem with, with the upside down and backwards. Remember, they, they held the people in Mexico that have a valid visa couldn't come in, couldn't come in. Mm -hmm. but millions were coming in illegally. But if you had an actual visa to come in, the you United couldn't States, come you couldn't. in. Yeah. So McAllen heard El Paso, all these border towns, the, the downtowns and the shopping were highly affected. Why aren't they letting them in? They have a wow. visa to come it's in. Like I know. And now they're saying, well, they have to have a, a vaccine card. I'm telling you, the guy already at the foot of the bridge. Pásale, pásale. I got your vaccine card right here. You know, two dollars. Yeah, $2. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fácil, bro. I was already. Up. We, babe, do you have a printer or something? <laughs> we can uh, do some. Uh, I'm a great. I'll put uh, you know some sort of scribble on there as a doctor or whatever. You yes. know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, man. So you know, COVID came around and and uh, it kind of like you know it freaked out a lot of people and a it lot did. of stuff got uh, you know and so you're deciding to run for tech what is texas land commissioner what does he do what's it all about it's a great question uh, and and it wasn't me like uh what am i going to do in a run today no it's it was it was thought thought out very 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 methodically <clears throat> i remember my first supervisor uh when i got when i got off right out of the academy and i went to el paso and he had the little talk with me he says, uh, the, the, the talk about a lot of things. He says, you lose, you lose drugs, you lose your job. Like, you know, certain things that they tell you about. And then, um, but he said, Victor, just remember, when you do your investigations, the only thing I'm going to tell you is do it slowly and methodically. Mm -hmm. And people didn't like him because they thought he was very slow. But methodical is very, I always love that word because you don't, you don't miss a lot when you're methodical. You pay close attention to yeah. everything. And that's the way I kind of took this role as Texas Land Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Very methodically, there's a lot of people running, and there's a lot of people that have a lot of support. But I'm like, this is this position has my name written on it. If they ever had any experience to do anything in the political world, it's this position. With my experience as a ICE agent in law, in law enforcement, remember I worked as a county level, state level, federal level, as a U.S. diplomat negotiating with Mexico. With I, I also worked in Europe. Um, and all you do is representative of the government and dealing with high level government officials. I know how to talk to them. I know how to negotiate what's best for the country, what's best for the state of Texas. And this office does a lot of that with our land sales and our land leases because of our natural resources of oil and gas and, and minerals and offshore drilling. I know how to protect the land of Texas. I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to sell it to China. Mm -hmm. That was, we sold 140,000 acres to a Chinese billionaire with ties to the CCP mm -hmm. what? In, La, wow. in in Valverde County in Del Rio next to Laughlin Air Force Base. Right there in the border. How in the world is that not a, somebody would think that might be a national security issue, maybe. Because mm -hmm. China is in Mexico. Yeah. Why are they in Mexico? Because they supply the cartels with all the uh And who's, who sold them the, the land and, and why and how and, and what? <sighs> You know, I mean, what what's that all about? Well, some of it is private land. Some might be public land. The point is there's no oversight. You're the Texas Land Commission. Go take a look at it. 
So Let me go see. Okay, so the Texas Land Commissioner, if, uh, if there's public land being sold, of course, who's selling the public land? That's the governor, the, the governor, state? the state, okay. the, 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 the general land office, and they have, and they say, hey, they want to buy this uh, big old acreage over here. Go talk to them, and you were the one that wheel and dealing. Uh, of all the course. Well, the work. first thing you would want to do is vet the individual. I know mm-hmm. how to vet people. That's yeah. what I did in my career. Uh-huh. Uh, very simple to vet. Well, you have you're from China, not just because, and I'm and I'm not being. Uh, uh, discriminatory against China, but if you have ties to the Chinese Communist Party, there's not going to be a sale of any land here yeah. for you. Uh, it's that simple because we have to stand our ground here in Texas and protect our lands. Now, uh, this office oversees veteran benefits as well, uh, which uh, I was just talking to uh, individuals today about, you know, cemeteries. We need a lot of cemeteries that are state-sponsored to bury our veterans, but where we want them is in rural parts of Texas. We have a lot of rural parts of Texas that have nowhere to bury their veterans. They're 100 miles away. Yeah. So that's the hardest part. I want to work on that. I want to build a facility, not the facility like the Donna facility and the other facility in, in between Zapata and Laredo where they house thousands of illegal aliens. No, I want to build a facility on state land for our veterans that are possibly homeless, don't have their documents in order, they uh, have substance or psychological issues. I've never seen a facility built. I'm not talking about the VA. Uh-huh. I'm talking about a facility tent like the one that we did for illegal aliens that you could get them off the street today. Uh-huh. Come on in tonight. You have somewhere to sleep. Then we'll work out and get you, st- you know, get you processed to eventually get you to the VA and go through that process. I've never seen that been built. I want to do that. I want to think outside the box. I want to bring what this office has to offer to the fullest extent in its authority. Um, Managed uh, crisis management. This office has teamed up with FEMA for any natural disasters. And I worked uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. I know how to be on the ground. And there's a lot of security issues. The looting, the people, the movement. Where are you going to place them? Land, right? Where are you going to place them? Where are you going to put them? And there was a lot of issues back then. You remember in Katrina, there was a lot of issues with Hurricane Harvey. Houston had no money. And I, I couldn't believe this when I heard this. That, uh, there was a $4.3 billion dollars given from the federal government for aid to Texas for Hurricane Harvey. You know how much money Houston got? How much? Zero dollars. And why in the world why? didn't they get any money? Because they used a criteria, a 105-point criteria they had to fill out, questionnaire. And that questionnaire uh, favored rural areas, not urban areas. So when they were done with it, Houston didn't qualify because it's full of people. But I'm a very logical and common sense person. I said, why don't you just look out the window and look at the floods? Mm-hmm. Why do I need a 105-point inspection? You got to look at the damage. Wow. The damage, and I use this example, wrong. I take my car in for service. It has a dent on the door. I know. I see it, right? There's, hey, I needed it fixed. And then they do a 105-point inspection on my car, and they miss the door. And they say, uh, it's, it's good. What do you mean it's good? I brought it in for the dent. Don't you see the dent? Yeah. This is the problem with we have with bureaucracies with our government. Sometimes what is in front of you in your face, you can't see it. Mm-hmm. You're clouded by all the other red tape that's in the middle of your face. I don't need, I don't want to deal with that. I want to be able to look out the window and say, yes, we need the money for Houston. Give it to them now. But if you do that, don't you have to go through any type of red tape in order for it to go down the channel to, for them to possibly get, you know, to possibly get what you're asking for? Yeah, but, 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 but the solution is that uh, I'm not going gonna, gonna to just abide by it because that's the 105-point inspection. And so that's the way it's been. No, I'm looking out the window. I know mm-hmm. that this is wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it right then and there. If it has to be changed legislatively, I'll do it. If it has to be changed because I have to go talk to the other commissioner or the other office, I'll walk down the hall. Yeah. You know, the thing about, you know, that that business, man, it just takes too long to do things. It takes too long. And then by the time it's done, all the money has kind of been, you know, it, it, it's a long process. And people nowadays, the way we are, we, we want overnight, you know. We want this done now, you know. Yeah. And people don't understand when there's something, like, happening. I see that on television. Right. You know, there's a disaster. It does take time. It, it does take time. And the red tape. So you've got to have the proper person in place to be able to really get on people's ass. That's right? me. That's going to be me. This office oversees billions of dollars uh, from our, our resources, from our natural oil and gas that goes to a public education fund. Mm-hmm. It goes money to our school systems, uh, universities and uh, public school systems. And I'm thinking, why are we giving the money to the school systems that continue to 
push CRT, critical race theory, and Marxist uh, uh, agenda on our kids, and this pornography at the age of five, and all this craziness that's going on in our schools, why are you allowing that? Why is the state st still giving them the money? You know that if you take money out of my pocket, I've taken money out of the cartel's pocket. The first thing you do is you get their attention. Well, I want to get the attention of these school districts and say, maybe we challenge that money. Maybe we don't just give it to you automatically. Maybe we look into it a little bit. Maybe I question it because they tell me, Victor, you can't do that. You know how many times they've told me that in my career? Can't do that, Victor. Well, I, I did a great undercover Chinese smuggling case from China, Mexico, and New York all undercover. And they said I couldn't do it. And after I did it, they were like, that's great. Good work. Good job. Mm -hmm. But I said, remember when we started this months ago, you said you couldn't do it because you have to think outside the box and you have to at least try. I'm not, I'm not afraid to fail. And I'll tell you that I'm, I'm unafraid in many other things. Like you could probably tell, um, I well, stared, I'm, I'm I, just being an undercover. I, agent. Know, I, I, know. I, I stared evil in its eye, man. I, I, I shouldn't be here. They almost, I was left for dead. And, um, you think a politician was going to tell me no. I answer to the constituents. I answer to the people. I wanted to go and go back to fundamentals. We put you there so you could represent us. Simple as that. And that's that's how I'll make decisions. And I will make decisions. I'm very, very um, cognizant of saying I will make the right hard decision instead of the easy wrong one. Many, many times, a lot of politicians, they make the, the that, that decision that's popular. It's the wrong one. Yeah. It's the They're following one, the Twitter the brigade, yes. you know. You know, They're I'm prepared following. to say, no, no, this is the right decision. It's just even right though or wrong, it's man. That's all it is. It is. But, you know, but having common the, sense. But having the courage to do it means a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was going to ask you, you know, when you mentioned about that, you're lucky to be here. You know, you were part of that uh, ambush uh, that you and Jaime Zapata were involved in. How was Jaime Zapata working with him? And did you get to know him, or was it the first time you all just – they put you guys in a vehicle and you all took off and so you didn't you weren't working with him or I, I met him I met him the day before and this is the irony of the story is I met him the day before and when we drove that morning on February fifteenth, uh, and all that we talked, I felt like I knew him all my life. Mm -hmm. Jaime and I shared he told me so many things personal. We talked about his family, he, his fiance his career, uh, he wanted to know how I did it. And uh, being from the border, he's originally from Brownsville. but sí, he was, como he el paso, was, yeah, yeah, he, el paso. he was in, uh, out of the Laredo office, and we were really, we connected, man. Mm -hmm. We connected. And I kind of, I wasn't that much older than him, um, but I was a little older than him, and I felt like a little mentor just yeah. in that short time. Yeah. Um, and he wanted to go to, to Mexico to serve. And I said, you better brush up on your Spanish because yeah, the Spanish wasn't very well. Aquí en el Valle hablamos diferente, <laughs> carna, ya sabes. I mean, me one time. The, the first time I went to, I was in Mexico. <laughs> I think I've been there one week. Uh -huh. And they put me to go do a human trafficking uh, uh, conference or in, in front of all these high-level Mexican officials uh -huh. in Spanish. Eey. And I did tell him, I did tell him, listen, I'm going to do this. And I'm not, I'm not the perfect, I'm not a native Spanish speaker. Uh -huh. And I'm going to do my best. And they were very friendly. No, no, Victor, of course. But I did tell him ahead of time. But, you know, there's always somebody that challenges yeah. you. And, I had and, a, and I the had language is different in different parts oh, of the Mexico, my right? Super different, yeah. super different. High levels of Spanish. And I had this lady, a uh, high-level official, ask me a question in Spanish. And I looked at her like a deer in hair, like, what? <laughs> what did she just say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't understand a word she said. Mm -hmm. And she had to dumb it down for me. Yeah. And she says, and then when she did, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, and then my Spanish started getting a lot better, a lot better because yeah. we had to write a lot in Spanish and, and communicate, but it's very, it was very important. And when I lived, when I lived in Spain, that's a whole other thing because that's Castilian, right? Yeah. I had to learn the, the, not just the Castilian, because I, I, I was able to communicate with the government fine as all. It was the slang that I had to learn. They have some weird slang, yeah. and I had I, I gave my kids one hundred percent permission to say all the bad words in Castilian yeah. because for us it meant nothing. It was it, 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 they're not the same bad words. Yeah. Uh, well, we got the <laughs> that's a slang here. We have slang. I won't say the word. I'll spell it out for you. But we, my kids would just trip out. Like the C U L O. Mm -hmm. That's a very bad word in Spanish over here. Well, Pitbull made a great song out of it, right? Didn't yes. he? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's he's Cuban, and they got slang too. But in, in Spain, they refer to it as anything. Though in the commercial, there's a bread commercial, and that listen, there's el principio hasta el culo. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, you're, yeah, And you're like, <laughs> and you're like. <laughs> Talking about bread, and my kids are like, <laughs> you know, you, you that one you can't say because for me it's a bad word, dude. 
the bread that's in Mexico that's the name of a woman's anatomy. Yes, you know, yeah. what I mean? and, and signs they have it. Uh, yeah. And to them, it's a, it's a very different culture. You have topless people <laughs> on 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 topless women. On, on TV, regular, it's, it's regular, but the beaches oh, are Oh, that's top. terrible, man. The, the, I don't know. Forget I, that, man. It I took don't. a long... <laughs> I'm never watching TV again. Oh, my god! It took a long time for me to just go into those beaches, but, mm. you know, I had to go. Yeah. I, I told my wife, where do you want me to look? Like, you just want me to stay up like this or look down the whole that, time? That's the only place he wasn't undercover. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll tell you what, I went topless. I went topless. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so what were you, were you working in Spain with I ICE in, as well? Uh, yeah, I was uh, an assistant attache in Madrid. I uh, covered uh, Spain and Portugal. Portugal is uh, and uh, parts of uh, France. And uh, that was an incredible experience. Uh, did a lot of human trafficking. Man, there's a lot of it. Labor, forced labor in Barcelona. Yeah, really, really bad over there too. Wow, man, they have a big drug, drug and immigration issue over there too. Is that the only other country you went to besides Mexico? Is was it? Uh, or you've been to Panama and all? Oh yeah, I've been. I uh, worked Central in Panama, America. Central America. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been to a lot of parts. Yeah, in the we've US. got uh, Felicia here with us. And uh, do you have any questions uh, you want to ask? Yeah, yeah, we actually do have some yeah, questions. We, we got fans on our chat zone. We want to we appreciate you joining us tonight. Yes, everybody joining. Uh, so Sal, I'm um, sorry, Joe Torres, Joe Torres first, uh, running for land commissioner, what would he bring to the table in regards to the oil and gas industry? Absolutely. The first thing, Joe, thanks for the question. When it comes to oil and gas, the first thing is I'm going to continue to fight the Biden regime because they want us to stop our production here. Uh, they don't like the fact that Texas is, is uh, has its own natural resources. We don't need anybody else. And Biden and they want to stop that production. Why? Because they're against the fossil fuels, they're against natural gas, they're against the. But then the, he comes out and he they, says, "I'm going to tell Saudi Arabia to, you know, right. boost up production." It uh, makes no sense because our gas is already going up again, three bucks. Right. You know, it's at three bucks. It's going to be going back up again. And and so that's one thing that I'll do there. And uh, I'm I'm going to oversee the sale of our land and the leases to our land to these companies that continue to uh, to produce that. Look at it more closely. See how that money is produced and how that money is distributed. That is the most important thing. Uh, to me, it's been told, oh, it's just a pass-through office. Right here. This land office is passed through. It's not going to be passed through with me. I'm not going to be painted on the wall. I'm going to yeah. be a person there checking it out. Yeah, well, it's not one of the most, uh, you know, uh, the one that many people talk about. That's why I'm not, and I, I can probably guarantee you that the majority of the people don't even know what the land commissioner does. And then that's why I wanted to bring him on the show so he can, uh, everybody can, you know, get, be aware. Uh, so what are the questions do we have there, Fish? Uh, we have Sal in the house asking, how can a veteran buy land? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of benefits, a lot of benefits for the veterans to buy land. I don't know exactly the, the, the procedure to tell you right now, but absolutely. I was talking to one today that works at the uh, GLO right now. And uh, with George P. Bush, who's the, the, the current land commissioner, and they're working on veteran benefits for housing, um, a lot of benefits for uh, medical. Uh, remember, this is state sponsored. And so they work a lot with the VA as well. And there's a lot of there's some limitations and what we can do. But there's a lot more in, that we could expand. And housing is a very, very uh, important one in land as well. And the 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 general land office is uh, the bread and butter of the United States is oil. Mm -hmm. oil and gas and this is where we employ thousands of people thousands of and i want to continue to employ them in midland odessa area everywhere we produce oil and gas this is what keeps our economy going yeah and uh you know it, there was a point when the united states was the number one exporter of oil and yep. we went over i think it was like 2018 or 20, 2018, something well, we were, like that. we were just independent just a year and a half ago yeah that's what and uh and it was pretty amazing to see that you know, if you'd go to Google and say, you know, top exporters of the oil in the world, yeah. U.S. was above Russia and, uh, and and Saudi Arabia. And, like, that was, like, a first because Russia, I think, is supposed to be, like, they're always on top. And then now they gave them the opportunity to open up that pipeline cancel, over there. Cancel, and cancel our Keystone pipeline. Yeah. So any other questions, Fish? Uh, we've got a lot of a lot of shout-outs. I mean, we have uh, Sal in the house. He said... Uh, Victor is getting my vote. Yeah, he's a right. veteran, uh, right? Yeah. And, and he's from El Paso, too. Yeah. He actually right. also asked if you had ever eaten Chico's Tacos in El Paso. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, you know, Chico's Tacos, one of those, you love them or you hate it. And uh, I, I do like, I'm, I'm a Chico's fan, absolutely. And then we have uh, Jose Z. He said, Victor's getting my vote. We've got Selena Tafoya. Vote for Victor Avila for Texas Land Commissioner. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys, for the support. So going back to... Um, 
to Jaime, you know, Zapata. Mm-hmm. You sat in the car with him in, uh, in the Suburban. Yeah. That was the first time you ever met him, and uh, you felt like a mentor. Man, it was a with great... Uh, Where did you all... You all got on, on the vehicle they, no, they, in no, Mexico they, City? In Mexico City, he was there, obviously, at a hotel, and I, I told him uh, the, the day before when he, they assigned him to me, I said, I'm not going to drive. I lived in the northern part of Mexico City, and you can imagine the traffic. I said... You need to come up to my apartment in the morning. And then another agent said, no, Victor, I know where you live. I'll take him to you at 630. And he took him and dropped him off in my apartment. And then mm-hmm. from there, we took off because we're north of the city to get out of the traffic and to get on the on Highway 57, which is the main freeway. It's like a freeway, right? Mm-hmm. It's the toll road. It's supposed to be the safe road. But we knew, I knew, I had found out there. I had done, I, this, this assignment was sprung on me that day before on, on Valentine's Day. Uh, I was never previewed. I was never briefed. And there was a lot of issues with it. There was an alert by the ambassador prohibiting anyone from traveling on Highway 57. You couldn't drive on that highway for personal reasons or business reasons. You had to get permission from the ambassador himself. And my office ignored that. And the guys from uh, Monterrey are saying, hey, man, they're having a lot of firefights, the setas. Uh, they control that whole area. And I'm like thinking, why the hell are we driving on there? First of all, every time we drove, we needed escorts, either the police, the military, or other uh, uh, U.S. law enforcement. No, no, you're going by yourself, just like that. And so I challenged it as much as I could. I had my supervisor call the supervisor out of a meeting, and I, I quoted him in the book, in my book that I wrote. And by the way, I have a little something for you right now. Oh, really? And um, he, and I quoted on them. He say, he comes out of the meeting, and we tell him all these issues, and Hey, there are all these problems, and he says, I'm not aware of any security issues in Mexico. How in the world are you the number two in charge of the whole country and not aware of any of all the security issues in Mexico? The whole country is a security issue. It's a critical level four by the State Department, just like Afghanistan, just like Baghdad. And he's not aware of any security issues? I mean, incompetence is real. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so when you're ordered, you're ordered. And uh, we were ordered, and here we go. And we drove and met Jaime that afternoon, exchanged numbers. And then when we took off in the morning, man, it was just, it was never an awkward moment. And I, he reminded me a lot of me because being from the border town, he got a call of a seizure at the port of entry in Laredo mm-hmm. that he had put a hit on. And I used to do that a lot. And people used to hate me for that because, you know, I put a hit on somebody. I go driving by a stash house where we thought it was a stash house and there's a car parked there. Looks suspicious. I put a hit on that car. What does that mean? A hit means uh, a lookout, okay. right? I will put a, a, a so surveillance. A surveillance. If I ever, if that car ever crossed the bridge again, I would have it checked. Okay. You know, it would so say call in the, the plates and everything. I would put it in the system and all that. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, two months later or whatever, I'd be at a party or happy hour or at a birthday, whatever. My phone ring. Hey, we got it. We got your car here. Load it with drugs, cocaine. What the hell? What are you talking about? Yeah, it's this Volkswagen Beetle, like. That's right. Well, I got to go. I got to work it. It's my case, uh-huh. right? That's why the agents didn't, didn't want to put. I already had other cases that I had to do. Well, all of a sudden, I have another case. Mm-hmm. But I did that all the time, and Jaime did that. And he was so proud when he got that call of the seizure. First of all, I knew this guy was a working agent like me. He liked to work. And uh, I remember a man, and I get chills because he says uh, on the phone, he's like, hey, I can't respond right now because I'm an assignment in Mexico. He was so proud of that, man. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I remember uh, uh, seeing him and and uh, thinking that, that that's me. That's the way I was. And I told him, keep that up, man. That's uh, this is what we're here to do. Wow. We're trying to do as, as make the biggest difference that we can. Yeah. And then you were driving down the highway, and so we 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 come back. We we already make, bring the equipment. A bunch of boxes, by the way. A lot of it filled the whole back of. And the what suburban. did they have? Paperwork and stuff. No, no, no. Uh, electronic surveillance equipment, okay. tracking devices, and uh-huh. stuff like that. And uh, man, and uh, before you know, it, he I had driven the whole time, and this is the first time that I gave him the keys to drive because uh, I needed to remember the BlackBerry that they just got rid of. I was mm. I was a monster on that. Blackberry yeah. man, man, my my to, thumbs were too fat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, the little key, remember the little keypad? Yeah, man, I used to write, everything. I used to repi- report, write reports on that thing. Yeah, man. I went wow. right past the, uh, that BlackBerry with uh, with the flip phone. I didn't want to mess with that. <laughs> well, once the iPhone came in, then I was okay with that. I started that, learning that call. That. that call that you heard, I made it from the BlackBerry because I had remember the Nextel radio phones. Yeah, yeah. And that didn't work. But anyway, um, uh, he starts driving, and within about fifteen minutes of him driving, we get literally ambushed by two SUVs full of armed uh, cartel members. We didn't know there were septa cartels at the time. Yeah. They, f- they 
push us off to the side of the road. Were you all armed? No. Well, I had I had two guns. I had two guns, but we weren't armed. They were in my backpack. Never had access to them. Never brandished them. Uh, never showed a weapon. So uh, people wanted, oh, you had guns, you shot. No, 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 we did not. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I could have had an AK-47 myself. It would have made a difference. Yeah. Um, the, uh, they surround the suburban, and a lot of commotion happened. And uh, what was going through your mind when that was what went on, man? Disbelief. And I what was Jaime's reaction? None. He just, uh, we basically froze like this. We, we both did. We both had our hands up like this. Right? You were outgunned. And oh, there we got an AKs, um, eight of them pointing at us. And uh, the guy, the, the guy that, at the door with Jaime opens the door, opened the door. The, the suburban was unlocked when he placed it in park. It unlocked four doors. And it, I see him when he opens the door and Jaime grabs the handle and slams it shut. <sighs> And hits the buttons. Well, when the buttons were hidden, we're hitting the buttons. My window, the the window buttons were also next to the lock buttons. And it lowered my armored window about two inches. But we didn't know. And the whole time, I'm yelling. I'm the only one talking. And I'm yelling at that guy in Spanish. We're Americans. Somos Americanos. We're Americans. We're U.S. diplomats. We're not who you think we are. You're mistaking us. We're Americans. This is a diplomatic vehicle. We're from the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. And the guy, you know, they have evil in their eyes. Get out. Bajate, in Spanish. Blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, the guy shoots off a couple of rounds with the handgun on Jaime's side, like towards the door or the, the, the front tire. And you asked me the reaction. And I was like, when that happened, I, I could not not. It took me a couple of seconds to say, did he effing shoot at, you know, it was, it was, it was weird. It, it, all of a sudden, I was in a foreign country. All of a sudden, I was the loneliest man that I ever felt. Being of Hispanic nature, I felt like I would have been in China for all intents and purposes because I'm not from there. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I was a foreigner to them. Yeah. And it felt like crap, man. Um, and um, uh, eventually, they surround. The whole time, I tell them, Let me, I'm a diplomat, all these things. And no way of calling for backup or anything. No, at, at like that, that point, the hands up like this, no yeah. way to touch it. I said, let, let me give you my black passport, my diplomatic passport. Nothing up, open the door. And before you know it, they came around to my window and introduced an AK-47 and a handgun right by my head. And I braced up against the, 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 the back. I mean, we couldn't go back. It's full of boxes. And I raised the window and caught the barrel of both guns. <sighs> And they start wiggling the guns. And I'm like this. And all of a sudden, boom, they open fire into the cabin of the Suburban, striking Agent Zapata several times and in the leg. They shot me once in the chest and uh, twice in my left leg. And How did it feel being shot? Didn't feel it. You didn't feel it? Didn't no, feel no it. No heatness or Nothing. anything? Um, probably the heat. but Any I didn't, pain? Any? No, the, that came later. Oh, uh, no. the, the adrenaline, I didn't feel any pain. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't even know I had been shot. And uh, um, I still had the finger on the button somehow. And after they stopped, um, I before they, I, I grabbed the handgun. There was a, a handgun and a, an AK-40. I grabbed the handgun, burned all my all my skin here. had burned off. And they finally pulled the guns, on, uh, guns out, and I raised the window, and they started spraying like crazy, you know, AK-47s. And I tell Jaime, go, go, go. And I grab the, the, the shift lever, and I slam it down. And he was already coming, becoming unresponsive. And he puts his foot on the gas, and I push my hand on his knee, and it crashes the so the SUV that's blocking us to try to get. I'm trying to get the suburban back on Highway 57, but at that point, Jaime becomes unresponsive, and the suburban rolls into the median. And I try to get the suburban back on the road, and that's when you see pictures online. That's where it ends up being. These guys were shooting the whole time. Then one SUV leaves, then the other one leaves and comes back and does a U-turn. And it parks right in front of me. And the two of them get off, get in front of the hood, and just open fire, trying to penetrate the, ga- the, the glass in the front. And I just, at that point, I just freeze them. And I think they think that I'm dead. Um, they take off. They leave. I get the phone, the radio. The next call, it doesn't work. I slam it on the floor. I pick up my BlackBerry. I make that call. And then from that call, I called the federal police. The only person that I trusted in the federal police was the head of our vetted unit. And... Um, and he didn't recognize because I called him on the office phone. I never call him on the office phone. I would always, always, always through radio. And it was ringing and ringing and ringing. And he, they have the old phones with the little red light, yeah. like the movies. And he finally answered it. He's like, uh, his name and uh, the commandante. And, uh, and I'm like, it's Victor Avila. And he didn't recognize me. My voice was kind of distraught, right? 
And they finally like, who's this? <laughs> like, it's Victor Avila, man. Okay, come on, I mean, he, he finally sent a helicopter and the forces. But there was a lot of things that happened in between there. I was trying to attend to Jaime and his bleeding. Then I got on the phone with the U.S. Embassy people when they dispatched him over. And uh, my my coworker is the one that told me uh, that from El Paso, and we were at the academy together. He used to be an EMT, and he says, uh, you got to check yourself. You got to check yourself. And that's when I noticed the wound on my chest. And like, what the hell? And then my leg. And I had been shot in the bottom of my leg. I, that one I hadn't seen. And and I thought, this is it. This is it. I'm going to die here. I'm going to bleed out. And I took my belt. Uh, he told me, take your belt and put it off on the top of here. And I cinched it out on the top and uh, waited there for 40 minutes, man. 40 minutes is a long, long time. Damn, I can imagine, dude. It's a long time. It's an eternity. <sighs> in, in the law enforcement world, it is a long time. And several people showed up to the scene. There, an ambulance, what looked like an ambulance. And uh, I never, some, one guy in an ambulance, like, you know, the ambulance shape of an ambulance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it doesn't have any markings. And one guy comes over, Abre la puerta. And, uh, and by that time, I had already got, got my guns, right? They were underneath the seat. I had grabbed my Glock and my uh, my uh, st- my SIG, and I put one in my belt, and I had the other one like this. And I said, open it, open it. And abre la puerta, abre la puerta. And he, he took off running. Well, later on, when we go to the trial in D.C., these guys get caught, extradited. They're testifying. That was the Cartel's, uh, the Setas ambulance. That's the guy that either goes and finishes you off, or he's the one that responds to the 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 guys when they get hurt themselves. Mm-hmm. And um, and then there was a, a federal police female that the mark unit that looked at the scene and took off. She didn't stop. I mean, she probably saw the scene with all the yeah. cars. So I was like, I'm out of here. I'm not gonna stop. Well, I mean, they're outgunned. They're I'm really outgunned. Bad. So you survived, man. It's a it's a it's a crazy survival story. It does something to you, man. It changes you. Uh, uh, for me, it, the good thing is that I had the support of my wife and my kids, and not the support of the government. Were they, they all living us. in Mexico with you? Yeah, they were. Like Kike Camarena. Yes, uh, and they I'm were they were extra uh, extracted in a very very unique fashion. They were. They told my wife, "You have an hour pack." Mm-hmm. My it was seventy two degrees in Mexico, and. She packs a bag of shorts and T-shirts and stuff, and she's, you know, very nervous. We're not trying to tell the kids, and they take them to a hotel, a secure hotel in Mexico City. Eventually, the next day, they move them out, and CBP gets them on an airplane to fly them to El Paso. They they took me to Jaime. After the helicopter, they took us to a hospital near San Luis Potosí. That's where we were at, the closest to. They took him to a trauma center. They took me to another. I didn't identify myself at the hospital, and I didn't want any IV, and they didn't want any medication because I – that – is when the fear set in. Mm-hmm. I was petrified, and I don't, I don't uh, wish that fear on anyone. Because when I in the beginning years, I used to have a lot of flashbacks and uh, uh, nightmares and stuff with the PTSD. And one of those things with me was the fear. I would dream of the fear, and it's not monsters' fear, and it's not cart. It's a very ugly feeling of fear that's deep inside, it's so fearful that I couldn't get off of bed. I couldn't, I was, you know, in a fetal position. I could imagine the trauma. The trauma, a lot of trauma. Mental trauma. Mental trauma. And uh, and so, you you know, you work through it in years. And, and How uh, did you do it? I was open to, to the treatment. I was open to allow people to help me. And let me tell you, uh, it wasn't, it, uh, I might be minimizing it. It was tough. It was hard, man. It was hard on my family. It was hard on my wife. I give her all the credit. Uh, she is an incredible woman because I always say if, if she could have left me before, she had reasons to. She really had a reason after that day. So I'm going to stay. I'm going to yeah. leave this guy. I can't stand this guy anymore, you know, because mm-hmm. I wasn't a good guy to be around, man. It, it was very hard on me and uh, I gained a lot of weight. Um, I lost a lot. You had of, to recover from the bullet wounds. The, the physical part for yeah. at first, I didn't walk for five months. How long after that uh, that ambush did you come back to the United States? Right uh, away. So no, right away. They, we two days later they re, uh, they got me out of the out of there at three in the morning on a DEA plane mm-hmm. to Houston. They finished the trauma there. We reunited two days later in El Paso, mm-hmm. and then they moved us out to DC. That's where I did my recovery. Yeah. And then the other nightmare started, and you're going to read about it in the book. We got failed by the Obama Biden administration. Oh man, failed. Two of the guns, two of the guns used against us are Operation Fast and Furious guns. Um, big mess. That was uh, Eric Holder's deal. Yeah, uh, he was the AG, I think, uh, the Attorney General for Obama, and there was a big old deal about that. They big were deal. running guns to the cartels, and so one of the guns that these cartel guys used to attack you and shoot you 
were part of that program or what? Two of the guns, yeah. He and what, what, what came out of that? What was the, uh, you know, the aftermath? Obviously, you had the PTSD, you had the trauma, you had to, you know, you know, get some help to, you know, bounce back and, you know, try to. Did you ever go work in that uh, type of uh, situation again? Uh, uh, did uh, anything come of... You know, what the people that did it, did they find out so, why they did it? Was it a hit on you guys or what? So it was a hit on Americans. It wasn't a hit on Victor and Jaime, but it was a hit on Americans. They testified to this. I always told them, they heard me. They know that we're Americans. They I yelled it out and they testified. I never had a scumbag testify and corroborate my testimony as an agent, but they did. They said, oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, oh, yeah, he was an American. We heard him. And they still decided to open fire. And that's what's changed in Mexico. Mm -hmm. That's the, the, the cartels have shifted, man. They have no respect for you. Obviously, any law enforcement, men, U.S. law enforcement, they don't feel threatened by the U.S. law enforcement anymore. And that's very dangerous for us because that's opened up, you know, whatever. They're on a free-for-all right now. But uh, it was tough. Uh, the, the, I say the, the Biden and the, the Obama administration failed us. It was very, very hard for us. There was no support. You would think, hey, we're going to take care of Victor and his family. You, you know, when you hear I went to Spain, it was because of other reasons, not because uh, it was like offered, you know, we're going to take care of you now. It's, it's everything that has worked for, like we got kicked out of Spain. I was supposed to be there three years, mm -hmm. two years, get out. Literally get out or you either get fired, you retire, get fired, or you get relocated. What do you want? But I, I had never done anything wrong. All I did was get shot. But they started treating me like I had done something wrong to them or to the agency, and I never did anything wrong to them. All I wanted was not, I didn't want anything special. I just wanted to take care of me, you know, just take care of me normal, whatever, whatever people, I don't know how you treat people that get shot in the line of duty. I learned about other, like the LAPD, the sheriff, LA sheriffs, uh, all these other people were very helpful except my own agency. Yeah. Take care of you as far as. Well, we got what assignment they were going to give you and, uh, you know, yeah. you know just and, have backup and backup. You know, yeah. I mean, I protect us <laughs> in your career. You see individuals that haven't done anything in their career. And all of a sudden they got these promotions and they're here and they're there and they put it in this spot and they're like, and they haven't done anything. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they're going to do something for me like that because I got shot, man, man. Oh, and I could, I could go to the Academy and teach. I could go, I could do a lot of things for this, for this agency. I could be a good voice for them. The point is they didn't want me back. Mm -hmm. And I was the last one to find that out. And it felt like crap when your agency doesn't want you back because all I knew and in my heart was to be a law enforcement agent. And I was a very, very devout, loyal, beachy federal <laughs> employee. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I struggled with that. I was a loyal employee. And, yeah. and, and, and it, I struggled with them. Like, they're, like listen, they don't want you back. And eventually when I realized, okay, I had to separate. And I, they didn't want to give me an early retirement. They gave me a medical retirement. In 2015, I medically retired. Was it, uh, I mean, was it a good compensation, <laughs> no, do you think? No, 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 no. No, it's terrible compensation. My family and I went to humongous debt because of it. But you know what? Um, we, we prevailed. And we, you survived. We survived. We fought back. My wife got her job back. We came back to the States and boom, 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 boom. And, uh, you know, I know how to fight. Yeah. And that's why these offices that I run for now, that I'm running for Texas Land Commissioner, you're going to get a fighter there. Yeah. You're going to get a person that has is battle-tested, mm -hmm. somebody that's been through that. And if you could be through that, the red tape is nothing for me. Yeah. Wow, man. Man, it's been awesome talking to you, bro, and uh, I really appreciate you coming to the show. And uh, do we have any more people mentioning or saying any comments or anything like that, Felicia? Yeah, everybody's, you know, positive vibes in the chat. They're all, you know, agreeing. And and uh, just shout out to everybody that's here in, in the chat. Okay. Carmen, Dar Dario, Selena, um, Daniel Lozada, Sal in the House, Ariel Perez, Senor Rudo. They're all tuning in. Well, I, I, like, I just want to say. Go ahead. The best part of it is the, is the background music. Yeah, yeah. la música pulquita para asustarme one time. Oh no, Reyo. Vamos a ir a hacer una pachanga y. Yeah. Tener unos cuantos barriles de vironga y. Do they say vironga in El Paso? Vironga, yeah. Are you still in El Paso? Or you're not. No, no, I'm in North Texas now. But uh, I was. We were having this conversation. I, I, I share all the all those languages with my son. Uh -huh. He trips. He trips out. <laughs> uh, like and even they're different. Like um, el canton. Do you guys know yeah, what canton? The house. The house? You see, you see? Le, yeah, the house. El conde cantoneas, <laughs> yeah. right? La rampla. Se le va a caer el canton al vato. Canton al vato. Yeah. El... <laughs> yeah. uh, um, 
este la Ramfla es la Ramfla the car oh, it's a car wow, wow. Yeah. este um, la playa donde estás en la playa I'm taking a shower ya yeah, yeah, me voy a entrar, me voy a avientar una playa de balazo babe yeah. that's I'm, oh. I'm gonna take a quick shower <laughs> speaking of, speaking of uh, uh, babe <laughs> este Uh, un bizcochito, un bizcocho, uh, 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 like uh, a girlfriend, uh, like uh, a girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We used to say Elvis, Elvis Cocho. Elvis Cocho. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell is that? But a bizcocho is a little. Uh, It's cookie. a biscotti, right? It's a biscotti. And, and, and then there's is? a Mexico. My mom makes them delicious. They're, oh, delicious. Yeah. They're like pan de polvo, pan right? De polvo, yeah, yeah. 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 But how, does, how do you relate that to a girl? What's your side? It's not cookie, carnal. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what time, bro. How uh, bad. So, election day, when is it? When is March 1st. March 1st. Early voting is on Valentine's Day. And is that a primary? And then primary. You, that okay. means you got to get me through uh, March so I could be your candidate in November. And how many candidates are, did you say are on this bill? A lot of them. A lot of them. So yeah, there's going to be a runoff. Probably. It's going to be a runoff, more than likely. So make me be one of the runoff. Make me not even have a runoff. If I get over 50%, yeah. I'm your candidate. Yeah. Well, you can't vote unless you register That's to vote, right. folks. And you have an ID to show the, to vote, <laughs> even though they want they don't want any ID to uh, vote. We have to, yeah. What the hell is that all about? We want to see your VAX card, but we don't need. You know, I mean, it's crazy. Easy. But I mean, if you're crazy. dead, you can vote sometimes. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah. He said, we need voting rights. Oh, yeah. We had like a 80 plus 75 million, 80 million oh, plus 70. God. Looks like everybody voted to me almost. Golly. Yeah. And then, you know, so it's it's crazy, man. Yesterday, Biden had a con press conference. Did you see it? Oh, yeah, I did, man. It's, uh, yeah. It's they're, they're, they're sad and entertaining at the same time. Yeah. You know, you're like, you're like, this man is, what is he doing? Uh, it's tough to it's watch. It's tough sometimes. to watch it. Yeah. After a while, you're like, "This is not in the good." Yeah. Why are they mm -hmm. allowing him to do that? And and it, and then it's scary, also. You're like, oh my god, this is the man in, in charge of the free world. Yeah. Well, that's why uh, North Korea is doing what they're doing. That's why Russia is invading Ukraine. That's why we have no stability. Because I want a person in the White House that people don't really like, like a yeah. lawyer. Like a you're lawyer. not supposed to like you're the boss. Right. Like, <laughs> you're not supposed to. Like, a guy's gonna defend us. The guy, like, you know, he's an. Yeah, he is because you know. Yeah. He's there to take care of us. He's there to govern. Yeah. How is it being a a, a, a nice agent right now? Is it, oh, uh, is it poor tough? guys, man. Ice agents, uh, Border, Border Patrol. Patrol agents, FBI agents. Oh, my God. FBI has been politicized, have been weaponized. And then the problem is that the field agents that sometimes don't have anything to do with this, uh -huh. it's the higher level, right? But they get affected. You know what travels down. Yeah. And uh, and it is a, probably the toughest to be a law enforcement officer at any level at this time, from a police officer, sheriff, trooper, federal agent. Uh, my heart goes off to them. I'm a big supporter of them every time I can. I, I fly my blue flag proud and, and my blue line and, and all that because they need the support. Mm -hmm. They need the support. This rhetoric uh, of killing on, on our men and all that, All that stuff is is has been blown out of proportion. It is not the truth that you've heard. Do bad things happen? Of course. Are there bad doctors? Yes. Are there bad police officers? Are there bad agents? Yes. But that's not the that's not the majority. That's not the what the people that are there there to serve and protect us. We need to back them up so they can continue to do that. Let's allow them to do that. If you don't let them do it, you want to defund them. But then when something happens to you, you call nine one one. Yeah. Uh, what was that famous movie with Al Pacino? You hate us until you need us. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, once again, uh, it's uh, this show was brought to you by the campaign to elect Victor Avila for Texas Land Commissioner. He's got a website. What's your website, man? VictorAvilaTX.com, and this is where I jump into the campaign mode. Mm -hmm. I need your donations. I need your support. These things cost a lot of money. Yeah. For regular people like me to run, It takes a lot for the the media, the uh, the advertising, the traveling, all that. I want to be able to get in every in front of many people as I can all around Texas. Please, please, uh, uh, I'd be honored if you consider a donation to VictorAvilaTX.com. The money is not for me, guys. I'm not going to pay my mortgage with the money. It's an investment for the the campaign to get me into this office, $10, $20, whatever you can give. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you so, so much. Yeah, so we've got the website. It's, uh, it's on the description. It's right in the description, yeah, so the just description. click on it. If you want to send them a few bucks, you know, everything, every little bit, bit helps uh, when there's a campaign Absolutely going on. Does. So 
uh, you can uh, send something over there. But uh, and, and then once again, March is the primary, sure. and then there'll probably be a runoff because there's a quite. A, everybody wants this uh, gig or what, dude? You know why? <laughs> I, I, when I when I signed up, they're like, uh, I started hearing this is the office that people run to gain higher office. Uh-huh. It's like a, a stepping, it's a stepping stone. Stepping stone to be a governor or to yeah. be something else. I'm like, well, oh, the guy not... right now is running for AG. AG. So, there's yeah. other. You'll do your research of the people that are running. Are the eight of us? Why are other people running for this office? If you're already an elected official, why do you want to be this office? Yeah. Very curious. Just look. Yeah. Just do your vetting. Do your yeah. vetting is very important. Look mm-hmm. me up. I, you know, I have my number there. You want to call me? I'll, I'll text me. I'll, I'm, I'm very open about it. I'll try to get back with you and. Uh, I'm very transparent. What you see is what you get with me right here. What are your plans for the next few weeks, uh, months? Where are you going to be? Ooh, uh, are you going to have any? T- are you going to come back to the valley to uh, do uh, some type of uh, event for people to go out and hang out? Because I know you had a meet and greet today or something. Yes, like we had uh, a couple of meet and greets. Uh, Isela, where are we going to yes. be tomorrow? Tomorrow we're going to be in Jim Hong County, and we're going to be in that's Hebronville, and we're going to be in Duval County in Freer. Uh-huh. And then Saturday we're going to be in Laredo. Yeah. And you're he'll gonna, be going to Lubbock pretty soon. Lubbock, and, and I got I got uh, San Antonio on Monday, uh, Houston. And you uh, had to pick the biggest state. Right? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Texas. Well, let, and let me tell you, I thought I, thought I knew Texas, yeah. and I thought I knew the state, and I've been around a lot of the states. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Have you been to county? Well, 254 it, counties it in the state of a, Texas. It Ooh. is big. Wow. I mean, can you imagine running for land commissioner for, like, Rhode Island? You're right. I mean... <laughs> It's, it's right like, there. It's the size of the real Grand yeah, Valley. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think El Paso was bigger than that, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But you decided to stay to Texas, Daddy, because yeah, it's yeah. the biggest state. Yes. That's right. In the Union. Alaska's more ice than anything. I'll be going to right. Houston, El Paso, uh, Oakland, uh, Live Oak, uh, Texas, Temple, Texas. Uh, of course, a lot of it in uh, Collin County, Denton County, Tarrant County. Oh, everywhere. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, and... Uh, Thanks for coming up. And, and, you know, just like, uh, you know, you were talking about doing your research on candidates. That's why I like to uh, bring in candidates into uh, the hashtag PBT so we can learn about him. I mean, I never knew about this guy. Uh, I did hear about him, but I never knew where he was from and all the story, the backstory to his growing up. And, and that's what I think is important for uh, people to get to know on a personal level whoever's running for any type of office. So I appreciate everybody out there. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, if you want a book, you just go to his website oh. as well, right? Well, I have a little something for oh, you. Oh, yeah. What, yeah? what do you got there, bro? This is a hard, the hardcover of my book. Oh, dude. Agent Under Fire. Oh, that's wow. awesome, man. Um, you got some good uh, endorsements from some good people here. Uh, you'll recognize the names uh, that they endorse it. And uh, this is a very personal book. When I wrote it, I, after I read it, because mm-hmm. uh, you you write it in, in steps, right? Yeah. And then out of order. And then when I read it, like, man, this is very personal. Yeah. But you know what? It couldn't be that. Did it, some it, of it, it give it, you it, chills reading yeah, it back? Yeah, right? man. It's hard to read. It's yeah. hard. You, you'll go through some emotions reading this. And then the last part, what I call the manifesto, is about border security. And you think I wrote it yesterday with what's going on? Because I, ha- I wanted to sh- remind people that I have expertise, too. I'm not just the guy that got shot. And I know I have a lot to offer still. And I put what I would do to to secure this mess and it's all in here i've seen this guy oh. speaking of manifesto on joe rogan he's like and i've heard him on uh on, on am radio talk radio as well i think uh he's uh i think he's on instagram as ed manifesto maybe that's him but he was like an agent undercover agent in mexico too mm. and he had an amazing story and he knows a lot of the in and outs and intricacies of all the cartels and smuggling and all that kind of stuff but uh, it's really cool to have somebody like you that knows the inside stuff and, right. you know, has been involved in something as, as crazy as that, uh, that ambush. And, and uh, you know, but you're going to have to sign that yeah, book for me, man. man. Let's see right here. There's a, there's a, a marker right, right there. Ahora yes, listo. sir. Me voy a poner a leer, babe. Don't yes. bother me no more. Okay? You want it, you, you, you want in English or in Spanglish? Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Both. Ahora le rock, se te va a caer el cantón con este libro. Yeah, man. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight, man. We appreciate you taking your Thursday night, and uh, we wish you the best of luck, uh, the Victor, and on your travels and on, uh, you know, we'll keep up to date. Let us know and let us know how it's going, and we'll tell our fans that. You know, remember Victor Avila, who was on the show, uh, this happened or whatever, but go vote for, you know, vote for whichever candidate you want, but you got to register to vote. Make sure to uh do your civil duty and uh, and, and vote. There you go, brother. Okay. It's all yours, man. Say, this year's a big election year, so thank you so much. Assist them at one time. Victor. Yes, sir. Thank Dios you, sir. Te bendiga. Thank you, Rock. Thank you for all the uh, 
the promotion and for having me today. This is one of the best ones that uh, interviews I ever done. Thank all you. right, bro, it's <laughs> tough. That's what I wanted to hear. All right, you all uh, say uh, goodbye to the cameras out there. Y'all have a good one. We'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>